In this latest installment of Chapter 11's discussion of liquids and intermolecular forces, I'll be introducing you to things like surface tension, heat curves, vapor pressure, and all kinds of other exciting, uh, well, exciting concepts that we talk about when we talk about liquids and intermolecular forces. <laughs> Many years ago, my dear wife was working as a customer service supervisor for a company that manufactures exercise equipment. One of her co-workers worked a night job at an IRS processing facility. Her co-worker, who is a sweet and older woman, lamented that one evening she get, grabbed an envelope to process that contained someone's tax uh, forms. And uh, she, she told my wife that whoever this person was was so upset with the IRS that uh, he evidently urinated into the envelope after putting his tax form in there and then put it in the mail. Now that is, <laughs> that is depl <laughs> that is deplorable behavior and I do not endorse it in any way. <laughs> but dang, it makes for a funny story. <laughs> okay. What, uh, <laughs> With that said, I wanted to go to the next slide where I've posted links to two humorous videos that my brother-in-law showed me recently. They don't have anything to do with chemistry, but if you'd like to, I'll post external links here to them that you can watch. You really have to watch the first one first in order to really appreciate the second one. Like I said, they've got nothing to do with chemistry, but I thought they were pretty dang funny. So you're welcome to watch them if you wish. After today's presentation, which will cover the rest of Chapter 11, Sections 3 through... Uh, Seven, and this might be through a series of three or four more videos, you should be able to answer questions about viscosity and surface tension, identify phase changes as exothermic or endothermic, describe a heat curve to your friends, calculate the final state and temperature of a system at equilibrium, calculate from enthalpy data the heat required to vaporize a liquid, rank compounds by volatility, boiling point, and vapor pressure, correctly read and interpret phase diagrams, and appreciate how cool liquid crystals are. That's quite a laundry list, so let's get started. So, some liquids flow very slowly, and others flow very quickly. The resistance of a liquid to flow is called its viscosity. Viscosity can be measured by timing how long it takes for a liquid to flow through a vertical tube, or by measuring the speed at which steel balls fall through it. The higher the viscosity number, the more viscous, or thicker or slower pouring, a liquid is. In this figure we see SAE numbers for two different liquids. The one to the left has a higher number, which means that it's thicker, pours more slowly, and is therefore more viscous. A liquid's viscosity depends on two things. First, its intermolecular forces, which we talked about in an earlier lecture. And second, its individual molecules' structures. First, the stronger a liquid's intermolecular forces are, the more viscous it will be because those individual molecules stick together and therefore are resistant to pouring. Second, some liquid's molecules have shapes that let them get tangled or intertwined with each other, making them more resistant to pouring and therefore also more viscous. For a series of related liquids, viscosity increases with increasing molecular weight. As seen in this table, we have a bunch of related molecules. The only difference is I'm getting gaining one more carbon in length and a corresponding number of hydrogens going from one molecule to the next. You'll notice that the viscosity measures increase accordingly. So molecules that are longer can get intertwined with each other and therefore be slower pouring and more viscous. And also, as you can imagine, viscosities decrease with increasing temperature. You might imagine that if I crank up the temperature, a liquid is going to become more mobile and more easy to pour. Therefore, its viscosity is going to decrease. We'll now talk about surface tension. Some liquids, such as water, behave as if they had an elastic skin on their surface. You can see that in this picture that has a little water skeeter. Okay, there's probably a more technical name for it, but that's what we called them when I was a kid. Gliding across the surface of a pond. Now this tension along the surface of a liquid is caused by an imbalance in the liquid's intermolecular forces right at that liquid surface. As you can see here, water molecules that are on the interior of the water are attracted equally in all directions by the intermolecular forces from the molecules around them. While the molecules at the surface only experience an intermolecular attraction that pulls them downward, so they feel a net downward force. Now that pulls them slightly toward the interior, which reduces the overall surface area right along the surface and makes them pack more tightly together right at the surface than the molecules on the interior below them. This explains why the molecules at the surface have surface tension. 
and also takes us to a wonderful problem. Hydrazine, whose formula is given there, hydrogen peroxide and water all have exceptionally high surface tensions compared with other substances of comparable molecular weights. First, draw the Lewis structures of these three compounds, and second, tell me what structural or intermolecular property do these substances all have in common, and how might that account for the high surface tensions in these liquids? I'm not going to do this problem for you, but invite you to do it on your own. I now want to teach you about phase changes. As we talked about in an earlier lecture, when we convert a solid to a liquid, we call it melting, which is also called fusion. Weird. When we convert a liquid to a solid, we call it freezing. A liquid to a gas is called vaporization or boiling. Converting a gas to a liquid is called condensation. Solid to a gas is called sublimation. And gas directly to a solid is called deposition. Did you know that each of these processes either consumes or gives off heat? For example, you can imagine converting a solid to a liquid. Let's say in the case of water. I melt ice, converting it from solid water to liquid water. Now you can imagine that, holding ice in your hand and watching it melt. Does it give off heat or does it consume heat? Well, does it feel hot or feel cold? Yeah, it feels cold. Why does it feel cold? Well, it feels cold, which means that it is not giving off heat. So why does it feel cold? The reason is because those solid frozen water molecules are sucking heat from your hand, using that heat energy to break themselves apart and convert from a solid to a liquid. Because melting consumes heat, it's endothermic. Now, did you know the exact opposite? That is freezing, converting something from a liquid back into a solid, is exothermic. It gives off heat. You probably don't believe me, but it's true. Have you ever put your hand behind your kitchen freezer? What do you feel? Yeah, you feel heat. Why do you feel heat coming out of the freezer? The reason is because the freezer is designed, exothermically speaking, to suck heat out of the box and pump it out the back. Where is all that heat coming from? Well, some of it is coming from outside the freezer, of course. But much of it is coming from the process of liquid water being frozen inside that freezer, which once again is an exothermic process. It gives off heat to convert a liquid into a solid. Now, does converting a liquid into a gas consume heat or give off heat. You've probably taken a pot of water and boiled it, and that should be a dead giveaway. If I've got liquid water and I need to convert it into gas, I have to put heat into it. It consumes heat. That heat is used to get those individual molecules to wiggle apart enough to break their intermolecular forces and then separate out converting from a liquid into a gas. Therefore, converting from a liquid to a gas or evaporating or vaporizing something is endothermic. But the exact opposite process, converting back from a gas into a liquid is exothermic. Do you believe me? Well, have you ever held your hand above a boiling pot of water and, and had the steam touch your hand? Does it feel cool or hot? If it felt cool, then it would be an endothermic process. But it doesn't. It feels really hot. The reason is because what's happening at the surface of your hand is those individual gas molecules are touching your hand and converting back into a liquid. That is, they're condensing. And in that process, they give off the same amount of heat per molecule as was required to convert them from a liquid into a gas. Therefore, converting from a gas to a liquid is exothermic. By analogy, subliming a solid to a gas is also endothermic, and its opposite, deposition, is exothermic. We can see that shown pictorially in this diagram. As you can see, each of these processes is either endothermic or exothermic, as shown here with cute little colors and arrows. And the exact opposite of each one of those processes is the exact opposite, endothermic or exothermic. Is that clear? The opposite of the same is the same as the opposite, and the same of the same same is the opposite of the opposite. Did I make that clear enough for you? Yeah, I think I did. Nailed it. Which brings us to a wonderful question. Name the phase transition in each of the following situations and indicate whether it's exothermic or endothermic. Remember, exothermic is something that gives off heat, and endothermic is something that consumes heat. The first one says, when ice is heated, it turns into water. The second says, wet clothes dry on a warm summer day. The beautiful thing about these processes is that they're things that you've probably experienced personally or seen. That takes us to the end of this lecture. Please stay tuned for the next one, in which I'll continue talking about liquids and intermolecular properties. In the meantime, please refrain from urinating into your tax forms. Until next time, have an enjoyable rest of your day.